Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. We'll get started in just a couple moments. We're waiting for a few more folks to join. Uh, and in the meantime, please, um, uh, please add your name and where you are to the chat. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone again. Um, thanks for being here. If you haven't yet, please add, um, add your name and where you are to the chat. And we still have a few folks joining us, so we'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes to get started. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have still a few more folks arriving, um, so we'll, we'll plan to get started in, in about one more minute or so. Uh, but if you haven't yet, um, add your name and where you are into the chat. It's exciting to see those coming in um, and take a read through to see where, um, where some of our group is joining us from today. All right, I think we are um, uh, slowing down folks, uh, folks arriving and joining us. Um, and, and we wanted to start our session today with a, with a multilingual welcome um, to acknowledge that we have um, folks with us from, from around the world today. Um, so I'll, I'll start and say hello and welcome from Leslie Cook. Um, I'm in Jackson, Wyoming in the United States. And Katrin, please go next. Nanda ni bore dai rai no hia a chroiso ir di gwyddiad cyfroes yma o Gymru. Hola, buenas ah. tardes. Os deseo os doy la bienvenida desde Santiago de la Ribera, Murcia, en España. Thank you both. Um, and now I'll I'll turn it next to my colleagues Mark and um, Taylor to um, to kick us off. Thank you, Mark and Taylor. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor McKay Bianchi, and I'm the executive director of the Rural Schools Collaborative. We're so excited to have you all here today for the first pilot event for rural educators across borders. Um, we hope that you folks will be really honest with us about what type of feedback you have from this event so that we can continue to make events and opportunities that are helpful for teachers um, and that are inspiring for you that you want to join in and participate. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I would like to first turn it over to Mark for 
a little bit of history about our collaboration and how this program came to be. Hi, thanks, Taylor. And as Taylor said, welcome, everybody. Horiso. Um, just a little bit of background. You're not really here to listen to me today. You're here to talk to each other and share with each other. So I'll try and be brief. Uh, I'm working for Welsh Government at the moment, a professional advisor for pedagogy. Uh, but I'm a teacher at heart and I've worked uh, as a teacher and a leader in five different schools in Wales, um, two city schools, urban schools, two valley schools, which in essence are in a rural setting, but have become industrialised very locally, uh, and then a truly rural school. And it was, you know, when I moved to the rural school last, you know, I really sort of reflected on the fact that I'd worked in so many different contexts uh, with so many different communities and the importance of community participation in each of them and also the importance of community engagement. Uh, yet the approach to that community engagement was different in each of the different settings. Uh, so there was a lot of thinking going on at this point. And the importance of place was really hitting home to me. And then obviously, as I started to explore this concept of place, I obviously started exploring place based learning. The other thing that was of real interest uh, was the term deprivation that was being used a lot. And particularly in my last school, and the term rural deprivation was being used. But obviously, having worked in other contexts, I realized that deprivation was present in each of the schools that I'd worked at, but it looked different. And therefore, I started really to try and reflect on this difference between rural deprivation and deprivation in other contexts. And in doing that, I discovered a piece of work um, from a researcher called Jimerson in the States, and he did some work into um, looking at um, rural deprivation, but more importantly, flipped it and looked at the rural advantage, because it's so easy to look at the deprivation, but how often do we flip it and look at the advantages of different settings? And I really started to explore the concept of rural advantage, and in doing that, I stumbled across the Rural Schools Collaborative, and uh, the sort of person I am, I reached out and thought there's got to be somebody out there listening of a similar mindset and I got in touch with Gary Funk who's in the call today and Gary and I started a conversation and that conversation has grown and that conversation ultimately has led to today rural educators across borders and hopefully this conversation will continue I'm sure it will continue and this start of our journey will grow and who knows where it's going to go I know I really hope that we as a group can grow get to know each other but more importantly get that wider engagement and who knows in time bringing the learners in bringing the children into the conversation and who knows having that school virtual school to school collaboration at some point in the future so as I said I've probably spoken too much. I won't speak for too long. Hopefully I've set the scene and I'll hand back to you, Taylor. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you to all of the teachers who participated in some of those early uh, collaborative sessions, teachers from rural US schools and teachers from rural uh, schools in Wales. And we're really excited to take this program and expand it further to uh, deepen that facilitation and that connection between teachers uh, on an international scale. So a little bit about where the program is headed. Right now, we're in kind of the creative phase, as Mark said, where we're not uh, it's not set in stone what it will be, but we're excited for this as a first step to launch the Rural Educators Across Borders program. Um, and the three main goals that we hope will come out of this program is a focus for rural teachers on resiliency, pedagogy, and teaching in place. Um, and I did want to note that we have early partners who are supporting this effort. We want to say a big thank you to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their support of Rural Schools Collaborative and uh, some funding for us to help start this program. We also wanted to say thank you to Teton Science Schools, our partners in place-based education. Um, and I'll introduce Leslie Cook as our facilitator and keynote in just a moment to talk about some of those resources. We also want to say thank you to uh, the National Rural Education Association, who is in partnership with us for this Gates grant. Uh, a special thanks to Mark uh, and the ERW team uh, from the Welsh government for being partners and inviting teachers. Uh, and also a, a thank you to the Princess of Girona Foundation. Uh, and they have a 
teacher preparation program called Teacher Generation, of which one of our panelists uh, is a part of. So without any more spoilers, we're so thankful that you all can be here today from very many different regions. Um, and I am so pleased to introduce to you folks uh, more formally, Leslie Cook uh, from Teton Science Schools as our facilitator for today. Leslie, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, as Taylor said, my name is Leslie Cook, and, and as I shared with you at the start, um, I'm based in Jackson, Wyoming in the United States, um, and I work with the Teton Science Schools, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, I am I'm really grateful to be here today, um, and, and big thanks to Taylor and the Rural Schools Collaborative for inviting me to be a part of this session. Um, I'm, I'm here both as, um, as a facilitator and the MC for us today, and, and also to share a little bit about place-based education as well. Um, as we're getting started, I'm gonna share just a couple of, um, kind of overviews of the session so you, you know what to expect. Um, so we, we just had a little bit um, of time hearing from, uh, hearing from Mark and hearing from Taylor about, um, about Place, or excuse me, about the history of this partnership and, and collaboration, how we got here today. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about place-based education and this idea of, of local to global learning um, and how I think that's relevant in this context for our, our conversation today. Um, and then the main event will be getting to hear from um, five rural educators who will share what we're calling a day in the life international rural teacher panel. Um, and, and so you'll get to hear more from them about their work, their experiences and, and their engagement in, um, in place-based education as well. Um, uh, then we'll have some time for some small group conversations to reflect on and, and to share what you're hearing um, or what you heard in the panel. Um, we'll have a share out from those breakout conversations and then we'll wrap up and, and talk about next steps from here. Um, so that's our, our plan for today. Um, and, and then I wanted to just share a couple of requests and, and thoughts around um, engaging well in our Zoom session today. Um, so first, we'd, we'd ask that if you're able, um, please keep your video on if you can, um, just to um, yeah, connect with other folks and, and especially in your breakout rooms to, um, to engage. Um, to second, be present with us in the conversation um, if you can. And if you need to step away um, to take care of other things, please um, know, that, know that you certainly can do that as well, but try to be present as you're here. Um, third, in your breakout rooms, we, we ask you to share the air and make sure that um, there's opportunity for each person's voice to be heard in those conversations. Um, and, and then between now and, and when we head into the breakout groups, we ask you to use the chat to ask questions or, or to share ideas along the way as well. Um, and uh, I, I added this to the chat and most of you who were, um, were here right from the start, um, if you haven't yet, please add your name and where you are to the chat. We'll use that as a, as a record of um, of the of the conversation and, and who's here today. Thanks in advance for that. Um, and, and with that, I want to talk a little bit about um, about why I'm here, about Teton Science Schools and, and about place-based education. Um, so, so Teton Science Schools is a nonprofit or non-governmental organization. We're based in, in Jackson, Wyoming in the United States, and we have a mission of inspiring curiosity, engagement, and leadership through transformative place-based education. Um, and, and through that work, we have a strong connection with the Rural Schools Collaborative and a, and a strong commitment to engaging and, and connecting with rural communities as well. So I think um, those, are, those are all parts of, of why we're here today. And, and really at the core of, of our work for Teton Science Schools is, is place-based education and a place-based approach. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what that is and what that looks like. Um, so, so for us, place-based education connects to, um, to different aspects of place. And, and we talk about and think about it in terms of the place triangle. And, and just to acknowledge this comes out of a lot of the sustainability leadership or um, literature. Um, and, and so not, not fully unique to us. Um, and, and we think about place from these three different perspectives. So thinking about the ecology of place or the natural history of a place or a community, thinking about the economy, um, where does the money come from in a place? Where do people spend their money? Where do they get their goods and services? Where are people employed? Um, and then thinking about the culture of a place. What are the traditions? Um, how do people in, interact together? Um, what, are, what are some of those aspects of place? And, and understanding those three aspects of place gives you a really, uh, I think, a, a strong view and, and a representative um, picture of the community where you are. Um, and, and, and with that, 
Um, Place-based education, I think really at the core is around connecting learners with community in order to increase engagement, to increase learning and to increase community impact. Um, and, and as we're talking about today in this conversation, I think connecting with place connects on a variety of different scales from, from thinking about yourself and your own personal interactions with place to thinking about your role in community um, and in your local, regional, national community, and then, and then your relationship with a global community as well. And, and today we're so excited to be able to convene an, an international team of educators thinking about um, their work and their teaching and their connection to place. Um, and while these arrows point in one direction, I think it really goes both directions. We're, we're moving back and forth in how we're connecting at a global scale and then, and then in a personal scale of place as well. Um, so, so, um, so that kind of is, as some core context for our session today. And, and just to emphasize this idea again, that, that I think at the core place-based education is really around connecting learning and community. And there's so much opportunity, I think, especially in rural communities to connect um, more strongly and more closely the learning, the learners um, and the community where you're based. Um, an another way to talk about place-based education, which, which I think can be helpful, is, is to think about place um, and learning about place as being experiencing your world in order to understand your world and then to change your world for the better. And I think that really speaks to the action orientation of place-based education, that there's such a strong and profound opportunity to think about how, how we make change, how we impact our place and how we can improve our own places and, and the world for the better as well. Um, so those ideas being really core. Um, and, and building from there as, as, as I think, as we think about our, our Teton Science School's approach to place-based education, really there's, um, there's a strong connection in my mind um, to these six principles of place-based education. Um, and these guide a lot, of, um, a lot of how we're thinking about relating with communities, how we're facilitating professional development experiences for educators, um, and how those educators are then bringing, bringing about and facilitating um, place-based education for, for their students as well. Um, if you're interested in, in more information about these principles um, and about place-based education, I dropped a link in the chat to, um, to a page on our website that has more information about these and, and other resources about place-based education. Um, and, and I'll say directly that today in this conversation, we're connecting, um, as I said, with this, this local to global principle of place-based education. So really thinking about how we connect learning on different scales of place and hoping that, that this pilot event of the Rural Educators Across Borders gives, um, gives you some sparks and opportunities to think about what, um, what's unique about your own rural place and what's, what's in common in collaboration or um, in connection as you, as you think about rural places across the world. Um, to think a little bit more about local to global learning. This, um, this uh, at the bottom is our, our statement about local to global context. Um, so we think local learning serves as a model for understanding regional and global challenges, opportunities and connections. And an understanding of self is a starting point to understand place. Um, and so I, I shared this, um, this visual thinking about self community and global connections. And then um, just one other visual that I, I think is helpful is, is thinking about um, a few more layers of the connection to place. Um, the self, the school, the community, and community might be your town, your village, your neighborhood, um, the, the city you live in, um, building up to, to then your nation and global scale of place. And, and just um, like I said before, the arrow is, is pointing in one direction and really it goes in both directions. I think connection to place uh, moves back and forth between these different scales. Um, yeah, and then, and then a final resource and idea I want to prompt and share with you around local to global and, and thinking about global connections to place are, um, are these um, United Nations global goals for sustainable development. Um, and, and these are the big, big goals. Um, they're big, they're lofty, they're aspirational, and I think they're foundational and essential um, for our world to think about development. And, and how we're engaging, um, engaging our places and communities well with, with some big global perspective and goals. Um, so these goals are, are what the UN says is guiding our, our development, should be guiding our development. And they move um, from ideas of, of no poverty and zero hunger um, towards gender equality, clean water and sanitation, um, affordable and clean energy, life on land and life on water, um, 
peace, justice, and strong institutions. And, and as, as we've connected ideas of local to global, often are thinking about how, um, how these might play out on a local level, and then how we can uh, engage our students in thinking about these from, from different scales and perspectives of place. Um, I'm gonna add two more links to the chat now. And these, um, these connect you if you're interested in more information on the global goals and wanna explore them for, further, or if you wanna think about how to teach um, these sustainable development goals. These two links I just added to the chat will give you more information um, about, about the global goals and how you might be able to use them um, in your teaching and in your classrooms as well. And with that, um, with, with hopefully a little context of what is connection to place, how might you think about different scales of place and, and connect on, on local to global levels on, on, a, on a very um, kind of broad, broad perspective? Um, I am, am so excited next to transition towards, towards our panel and getting to hear from some rural educators about their own um, experiences and connections. Um, so what we'll, what we'll do next is, is we'll start to hear from the panelists. Um, I will ask them each to introduce themselves and then ask, um, ask them several questions. Um, and, and then we hope that we'll have some time to um, address some of um, your questions as well, questions that might come up from you um, who, who are watching these presentations as well. Um, and, and so we'll start by asking each of the pan panelists to introduce themselves. And I'd like to, um, to invite Alan Williams from Wales to introduce himself first. So Alan, please go ahead. Hi, um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm Alan, uh, I'm a physics teacher in a small rural school in Whitland in, uh, in South Wales. Um, I've been teaching for about two years and I've just started my third. And I got into teaching um, through science outreach and I just sort of ended up in a rural school. Awesome. Thank you, Alan. Um, next is, is Katrin Thomas from Wales. Catherine, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, dim problem. Uh, then are you Catherine Thomas, uh, Rindisky and Eskolgan Rada Bereiron. So for those of you who didn't understand that, I was speaking Welsh. So I'm the head teacher of um, a primary school right on the west coast of Wales. Um, it's in a, a coastal um, small town. We're classed as rural. We've got about 225 children in our school, which is quite big compared to the other schools uh, in our in our cluster. Um, I've also taught in um, some uh, city schools in Cardiff, that's our capital city. Um, so I've got experience of, of, of both. We love teaching in Aberiron. Uh, it's it's a great place and so much to be gained um, from the rich um, culture and, and history that we've got there. Um, I, I've also been a pupil in a small school with 30 children. So uh, rurality is very much, uh, it runs through my blood. Uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you, Katrin. Um, next is Holly Pitts from the United States. Holly. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly Pitts. I'm a second year fourth grade teacher in a little town in the middle of Illinois called Levington. Its population is like 800 maybe. Um, I am, I live about 35 minutes away, but it's also a small community, so. Great. Thank you, Holly. Um, next is Lola Rubio from Spain. Lola. Hello, everybody. My name is Lola Rubio, and I am from Murcia in Spain. Uh, this is my first year as a teacher, and I teach at an international school in Santiago de la Ribera, in the southeast coast of Spain. But I was granted a scholarship from the Princess of Girona Foundation last year, so I was an intern, um, an, an intern teacher, a student teacher in a rural school in Extremadura. It's um, in the west side of Spain, so really close to Portugal. And, and nice to meet you. Thank you, Lola. And finally, Randy Rovetto from the United States. Randy. Thank you, Leslie. Um, good morning, my name is Randy. Um, I taught previously in California. 
for a couple of years, but this year I'm in Wheatland, California, uh, teaching high school. So I have my same freshmen um, and my sophomores that I taught when they were eighth graders. So this year has been a great opportunity. Love the small town, how we can roll over with our students and follow them through graduation. So I'm excited for this morning. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you each so much for sharing a little bit about yourselves and introducing yourselves. Um, now I'm going to stop my screen share and um, and we'll um, we'll move into um, a, a couple of rounds of questions for the panelists and we'll rotate through who starts and and um, and the order that we share. Um, and and the first question for the panelists and you started to connect to this each already is um, is why did you decide to be a rural teacher. And what inspires you to do this work and, and thinking about your inspirations, both to education um, and, and to working in, in rural schools as well. Um, and, and for this question, I'd like to invite Katrin to start first. Katrin. Um, thanks, it's, it's a great question. I suppose um, you can see from my background that uh, I, I live in a very rural, that's, that's a virtual background, by the way. It, it's not, uh, my window doesn't face that view, uh, unfortunately, but we live right near the sea and, and it's um, a very close knit uh, community where, where I actually live. Um, but I travel about 20 minutes to Aberira and just, just up the coast, which is equally as close. Um, and although I did go to um, university and and then went to live in the in the big in the big city and uh, had an experience of that in in my in my twenties and absolutely loved it. I was always um, sure that I wanted to return uh, to the um, to rural Wales um, to, to settle down. And it's a it's a familiar story um, for many um, young people in Wales where they they go to the city and sometimes they return. Um, uh, to the rural areas. However, it's got to be noted that sometimes people don't return and, and that does have a, an impact on, on um, the more rural areas of Wales. But I came back and I had a job in Aberiron when, when I was a teacher and then just really loved it and uh, had an interest in, in leadership and enjoyed making things happen. And one of the things um, that really inspires me um, is, is exactly what you've been talking about already, Taylor, with regards to place-based learning, really giving um, the pupils you've got in your care, in your school, the opportunity to really get to know themselves and get to know themselves through their loca locality. We've got a quite simple vision in, in, in our school where we want our pupils to have so much respect for each other and where they're from that they will grow up then in, in time to be those people in the community who who, who care who care about the local park who, who will uh, volunteer to make sure the beaches are clean who will um, you know be uh, be volunteering in, in our residential homes etc etc um so those are the kinds of things that, that keep us going an obvious one as well you heard me speak welsh we're a welsh uh, medium um, primary school and we're all very passionate about um uh, educating our children about the the, the rich and um a variety of, of culture we have we have in Wales. It's, it's something that's is very important to us and especially when we um, discuss our, our identity uh, as a nation. Uh, the language is only one part of it uh, and there's so 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 much more and having as a, an educator having the opportunity to um, light that fire in our in our pupils bellies with regards to um, a love for their, their country and a passion um, for their communities is, is really important. Um, and I don't take too much time. I could talk about this forever, as you probably understand by now. Um, so I'll pass on to the next. Thank you, Katrin. It's, it's clear you have a strong passion and, and commitment to this work. Yeah. Um, let's hear from Holly next. Holly, why did you decide to be a rural teacher and what, what inspires you? Uh, I decided to be a rural teacher because I grew up in both settings. So I started in a rural school and um, when I turned nine, we moved to like a suburban urban area and I felt like I kind of fell through the cracks um, where I went from everybody knowing everything about me, which has its good things and its bad things. Um, but they, I, I always felt championed. And then when I moved to a bigger community, I didn't really feel that anymore. So 
um, when I have, I have two kids of my own and I want that for them. So teaching in a rural school since I had children has always, because of my children has been pretty important to me. Thank you, Holly. Um, Lola, will you share next? Um, so I always attended an urban school. Uh, during my first internship uh, while I was studying, I was in an urban school. And then I did my junior year of college in the US and I stayed in school there in another urban school. So when I saw this little Facebook advertisement saying that um, I could be a rural teacher for a couple of months and learn from a different school. I believe that it was my duty to take part in that experience and, and grasp bits of different schools and different children, and different teachers, because I believe that that could make me a better teacher for those students and also the students I will have for um, the rest of my career as a teacher. So at first I saw it as a, as a opportunity to become a better teacher. And while I was there, I realized that uh, rural teaching was, was completely different to what I was already experienced. So um, I, I got a lot of, um, I, I realized how passionate and how different rural teachers were. And, I got inspired by their work, uh, their everyday passion, their, um, the way they engage with children. And every, every day I'm still moved by, by what they did and what they showed me during um, those months. Thank you, Lola. I think that's so, that's so important to connect, to think about how you're connecting with your students and their backgrounds and, and being responsive to them. Yeah, thank you. Um, Randy, I think you're up next. Um, similar to Holly, um, I had as a student kind of experience in both in a more um, urban setting than in a rural setting, but on the opposite of Holly, um, I started out in going to elementary school in a larger city. Um, so when my family decided to take the move um, during the Great Recession to a more uh, rural area, uh, it was a type of culture shock that I experienced and, and it took time to adjust to all of a sudden everybody knowing everything about you. I guess I got comfortable being a number in the classroom and then having teachers ask me how my day is going and, and care about my sports and knowing that I want to get involved in clubs. It was really weird. I felt like the big brother was always watching kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, cause I was a teen and trying to live my own life. And um, so when I went to college and I left my town, um, I, you know, I, I had that mindset that I'm never going back. Um, and then when um, I was taking all my undergraduate courses and doing my service hours to earn my teaching credential, I realized that that was exactly like the best environment for a student to thrive. And I constantly reflected like, would I be here at university had I been just a number and kind of fell through the cracks? So that self-reflection I think really kind of pushed me um, to go towards um, becoming a rural educator. Um, also, when I went to university, I learned so much about diversity and equity and global issues that you were talking about earlier. And I just, felt that um, the school that I attended uh, when I was a teen kind of lacked that awareness. I felt um, like I had so much to learn. And as a teacher, I wanted to bring what I learned um, at university back to my same town. So um, I returned home to teach both the middle school and the high school that I taught at. Um, I attended as a student myself. So kind of being back in the same environment, but I feel as an entirely different person, um, I think is a way for me kind of to redeem the negative feelings that I had towards that close community and just provide my students with love and ask them about their sports and ask them about their clubs. And even though sometimes too, they're like, oh, don't ask me about my sports game, we lost or whatever. Um, I have to remind them like, no, I'm asking you because I care, even if you lost, like that's part of life. Um, and so it, it's just returning home to teach has just kind of been part of my life journey as becoming an adult with a career. So I'm very fortunate for the environment that I have and to be able to work alongside a lot of the teachers and to now formally thank them for caring about me in my small community, so. 
Thank you, Randy. That's um, I, I I think I I hear that message and story often of, of someone who grows up in a rural place thinking their their best option is is to leave. Um, and 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 then I, I just appreciate hearing what what inspired you to connect and come back to to teach in a rural place and that connection to the impact you have on your students. Thank you. Um, yeah, and let, let's hear from Alan now. Um, Alan, what, what inspires you to this work and to be a rural teacher? Well, I, I got into teaching uh, by accident. I, I started out in university, I was looking for a job and uh, they were doing a lot of science outreach at the time, working with kids in the local area where I studied in Exeter, which is quite far from uh, uh, Carmarthen in South Wales where I grew up. And so I started working with, with kids during the summer and half terms, running science clubs and doing astrophysics and making things blow up. And it was awesome. And they were awesome. And it's so great when you see them smile after you make something float in the air that they thought couldn't, or when you see a rocket go what feels like miles. And it was really great. And so when I finished my physics degree, I trained to be a teacher in, in Swansea, um, the closest city to where I live. And uh, once I did that, um, I thought I'd go work probably in, in Swansea, in the city, um, but I didn't. I, I came back home to Carmarthen and I got a job in a school even more rural than where I grew up. And that's where I've ended up. And I think the reason I stay here is because I just absolutely love working with kids. They are, they are the best. And I think that's why all teachers kind of stay, because young people come up with the craziest ideas and they're always happy. And it's just such a pleasure. Um, yeah, so that, that's how I got into teaching and, and that's um, what inspires me to do my work is just to have fun doing science with them. Thank you, Alan. I think that joy in, in education and in our work sometimes um, sometimes can be fleeting and you just centered that for me as being so core to, um, to connection with education and with students and yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, so building on kind of those are big ideas of what, what draws you to be a rural teacher, what inspires you to this work, um, we want to connect in, in next to some of the core ideas of, of the panel and the session today, which is, which is thinking a little bit about the day in the life of a rural teacher. Um, and so, so what I'd ask as the question for each of you next is to walk us through a little bit of your day, maybe the first couple of hours, um, thinking about your commute, getting ready to teach, planning for your lesson, um, maybe your, your first class or first teaching of the day. Um, share, share with us a little bit um, about those, those first couple hours of your day. Um, and, and for this question, let's start with, um, with Holly first. Holly, will you kick us off? Sure. So I live about 35 minutes away, which is not that long. Um, it's, an, it's a nice little drive though. And our district is kind of smack in the middle of an Amish community. So there's a lot of horses and buggies out. Uh, so I'm kind of driving and dipping and dodging. Um, when we get to school, I've got a couple of minutes between the time I'm supposed to be there and the time I get my kids from outside. And we, we try to make sure that they've had their breakfast and they've had um, some of those needs taken care of. We're kind of a low income area. so. Uh, making sure some of those Maslow needs are met so that they can be in their best learning. And then we do a morning meeting. So I have a job for every student and some of those jobs take place in the morning. So if, for instance, I wasn't at school, like today, I'm hoping it went off without a hitch, but I have somebody that turns on the computer and pulls, pulls up the morning meeting slide and somebody that does our lunch count and uh, somebody that turns the lights on, we have um, flexible seating and lamp lights. And so they have to pick out those, um, like they have to pick their flexible seating. So I have somebody that draws um, little rubber ducks with their names on them. Um, and then our morning meeting has like a fun fact and a poll, um, like who likes pizza better than cheeseburgers or something silly like that. And then some kind of inspirational video. And they... I didn't know how much they would love those silly little two minute videos, but they do. And so we watch, we repeat them a lot um, just to kind of, not to take up time, but because they just get so inspired. They're just so um, receptive to any story outside of the 100 people that they know. Uh, so they, they really just get into all the different professions and all the different stories that are out there in the world. 
after that, we start, we jump into math and then our core subjects. Um, we got a STEM room this year. So uh, we spend some time there in the mornings occasionally. And yeah, so that's pretty much my day. Thank you. It sounds like quite a commute and then and then getting into your school day too. Um, some good good opportunities to connect with your students and, and see them as individuals. Thank you. Um, Lola, will you share next? So I used to live uh, in the nearest uh, city to the town where I was teaching and most teachers did too. So I would wake up a bit earlier than usual than I would do in, in the school. And that might be late for most of you because it would be around seven. Uh, but that's early for us, you know, we're laid back. <laughs> um, but we would, I would wake up and get picked up by, by the principal of the school who lived really close by, or we would uh, meet at the meeting point and park our cars and drive together um, to the school. It, it was like a 50 minute commute, not 15, 50 minute. Uh, it's 65 kilometers away. I don't know that in miles, I'm sorry. And we would talk about school, but also uh, personal things in the car. And that made us have a great bond. Uh, at least I felt like we were really good colleagues, but also really good uh, friends. And we got there about 15 minutes before starting classes. Since there is no janitor, we had to open the main gates, open the windows, open the doors, turn on computers. And five minutes before starting school, we would choose a song and start playing music. Uh, children do their entrance with music. And because of COVID, now we had to take their temperature every day. So they would come in a line, um, smaller kids first, it's a 20 children school so you can imagine how this is um i would sing and dance and ask them how they're feeling um they're normally really sleepy uh so we'll get into the class at alone and at least for my classes um i'm a primary i haven't said this okay i'm a primary school teacher um but i focus on teaching english as a foreign language so i like asking them something about what they did in the afternoon the day before or something about their feelings or also funny questions like what do you prefer or what would you rather do these or that and kind of chit chat before starting the lesson. Thank you, Lola. And that um, I, I suspect that the COVID protocols are something folks across the across the world can relate to right now, thinking about temperature yes. checks and other other aspects of um, our, our shifting world in the pandemic. Thank you. Um, Randy, you are up next. Thank you. Um, so my uh, high school uh, serves our local Air Force base. Um, so our population, our student population kind of fluctuates back and forth depending on the needs of the military. Um, so on average, the high school serves um, about 700 students for about a, like a 40 mile radius um, this year because um, a lot of military families weren't able to move where they needed to because of COVID. But since a, a lot of the COVID restrictions with the military have been lifted, we had a huge influx of students um, to 1100 for this year. So our summer consisted of putting up portables taking classrooms and putting temporary walls, um, just how can we serve and meet the needs of all of these students since we have this like unprepared influx um, of kiddos coming in. Um, so it's been a little bit crazy kind of launching the year, just getting our rosters and thinking, how are we gonna accommodate so many students when we're used to the smaller community? Um, so that's kind of been a shift. Um, so my morning, just like many of us in rural areas starts out with the commute. Um, I have, I've had the pleasure of being on both sides. Uh, when I taught at our local middle school, I lived across the street. So um, I lived in the small town because everybody knows everyone. Students would knock on my door for homework help. They would walking down the street, hey, Mr. Beto, uh, can I ask you a question about the quiz really quick? Um, so my life, like we have one store, we have a Walgreens. And so 
Um, everywhere I would go, it was, Mr. Vetter, I have a question, or parents want to talk. And so my life was entirely consumed um, by my profession, which as teachers, we all understand that anyways. Um, now I'm at the high school. I have about a 35 minute commute through back roads, through orchards. Um, it's a constant battle between commuters and tractors every morning. Um, lots of, of um, just like what Holly was saying, driving in and out of tractors and dodging um, to get to work on time. Uh, when I get to school, I always have students um, kind of waiting. Our bus drops students off at 6.45 in the morning. Um, so by the time I get there at 7.30, they're hungry. Um, same thing that you guys are saying, making sure that they're ready to go in the morning. We walk them to get breakfast. Um, this year, because of COVID, all students eat for free, which is fantastic. Um, I'm totally up for keeping that going for the rest of um, their public school career because um, it's important. They need food in order to learn. Um, by the time we make sure all of our kiddos have eaten some sort of nutrition, um, we usually check our emails to make sure if we are covering any other teacher. Uh, this is a chronic issue for us right now. We have no subs available. Um, in a rural community, it's very hard to get anybody to drive out to our school. I'm seeing lots of nods. It's very difficult to get anybody to drive all the way out in the middle of rice fields and orchards to um, substitute teach, uh, especially in California right now, we have a, um, a huge housing crisis and the cost of living is very high for our area. So to ask um, for enough substitute teachers to come and work for us without benefits, without a, um, just like a permanent salary or anything like that, it, it's hard to get subs. So usually we check our emails in the morning to see if during our prep hour, if we need to cover or relieve teachers. So oftentimes our students I mean, our teachers aren't getting time to prep, lesson plan or grade because we have to relieve another teacher or play substitute for a little bit. So um, that's usually this juggling game in the morning. Um, after that, I'm glad Lola mentioned um, lunch. Was it Lola or Holly mentioned lunch count, making sure that students um, have lunch. We have, oh, okay, sorry, it was Holly. Um, we have, um, her name is Miss Cookie. We have a lady come in and she takes lunch count and she usually, when she pops into every classroom, says a joke or a funny fact or a riddle. So she's really creating this sense of culture and this community for our classroom. The kids love her. She's their trusted adult on campus. Um, so, so bringing back kind of that small town vibe with her, uh, everyone knows her, which is fantastic. Um, as a high school teacher, I have seven periods of English. This year to accommodate um, the influx of students, we went from an hour per class period down to 47 minutes. So normally we only teach six periods of English. And now that I have to teach seven, our class time has, has decreased a lot. Um, so now, right now we're battling that with um, potential learning loss due to distance learning. So um, it, th there's a lot that we're trying to make happen in 47 minutes. Um, after students you know, go a few periods, we have our lunch period, which is 35 minutes long. Um, lunchtime is when teachers provide intervention for our students. Um, that's when we pull kids in, give them a bonus treat for coming in on their lunch time, um, and we're working in small groups. We are helping them with their homework, whatever they need. Um, many students have seen me like quickly shove a sandwich in my face in the middle of this time, um, which I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to. Um, and so they're, they're used to coming in at lunch and getting that extra intervention. Um, at the end of the day, our schedule is packed with meetings. We have um, 504 plans. We have IEPs for students with special needs. We have trainings, professional development, um, and lots of meetings around trauma-informed practice right now, especially coming back from COVID. So um, I feel that a lot of us right now, um, at least in, in my school district, we're just trying to stay above water, trying to get caught up um, as a result of COVID and the influx of student population with the military base right here. Um, but every single day I go home and I'm so excited um, just to start the next day with those kids because like Alan said, that's why we do it. We love them and we'll keep doing it for them. So, thanks. Thanks, Randy. I, I can't get over the influx of students that you had. That, that is tremendous and, and just makes me think a lot about um, that uh, or I wonder a lot about that as, as if that's a trend in rural schools, big shifts in populations. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alan, will you tell us a little bit about your, um, what your day is like? Certainly. Um, so I usually get up at six, um, 
Uh, from then, it's a, a rush to get ready. And I usually start doing as much schoolwork as I possibly can before I leave for school. Not for the day I'm in, but usually for the next day, because uh, um, I try and get everything done in the morning and I don't have to worry so much in the evening. So I usually leave for school at about half seven. I live about 20 minutes away. Um, but it doesn't take 20 minutes because I will almost definitely be stuck behind a tractor every day. And so it does usually take me about half an hour to get in. And once I do get in, I usually mark some books or something or prepare some resources until my form class gets in. So every morning um, I have the same class from uh, about half eight to 10 past nine. And at the moment it's a group of year eight. So that's 12 to 13 year olds. And I see them for that time every day um, and we do a range of activities. So Mondays we do um, uh, silent reading and then Tuesdays we do assemblies, Wednesday we do maths, Thursday we do literacy and Friday we do some mindfulness. And so it's nice. So I, I get to see the same group of people um, every day. We do get to do some some great stuff like today uh, they came in complaining that they had to go to school every day and because we were doing maths today I thought it'd be a great opportunity to uh, approximate how much time they do spend in school and so we we spent our lit, uh, numeracy session this morning calculating uh, how much time they spend in school per year so it was it's great and because I see them every day I know them so well I can pretty much guess what they had for breakfast half the time um, and so, so that's awesome and then at 10 past nine um they go to their lessons and I teach in a, a secondary school. So I teach year ages 11 to 18. Um, so my, my lessons can vary quite a lot. Um, so I have five one hour lessons in the day with a 15 minute break between the first and second lesson and an hour break for lunch between the third and fourth lesson. And the day usually, uh, the, the lessons finish at half three, but the, the day continues for me until uh, the work is done. So that, that's my day in a nutshell. Thank you, Alan. I, I appreciate hearing about how you're designing lessons um, based on the students' curiosities, calculating the time that they're spending in school. That's, um, that, yeah, such a great example of, of using a student or learner-centered approach. Thank you. Um, Katrin, let's hear, to, hear from you a little bit about your, your day. I'll stop. I, I love my commute. It's, it's, it's where I get to close the door on one lot of chaos in my family home. And I have 20 minutes of thinking time before I open the door on another set of chaos. Uh, but perhaps to just um, explain a little, I'm on secondment at the moment on a part-time basis uh, to the authority, um, helping them with the implementation of, of an, the new curriculum that we've got coming in 2022 um, in Wales. Um, so it's a little different. So sometime I, I'm on, on the road commuting to work and the other time at the moment, I'm working from my office at home. And I really miss that thinking time. I, I find it really uh, useful. But from the school day perspective, um, it does look a little different now than from, from what it used to look because of, of COVID, obviously. Um, uh, we have our breakfast club started again. Um, so we have some children who arrive at school at eight o'clock. Um, we have a free breakfast club for them. Uh, but generally, we have a staggered start time um, so that we haven't got too many children arriving at the same time. And that's organised in family groups. Um, and they start coming from half the state onwards. Um, and the, school, uh, the class teachers um, uh, are at the different entrances, uh, greeting them and then taking temperatures. And then the school day generally starts with, um, um, we call it Amser Dully Darlen. So it's, I, I love reading. And basically they're all different. It's a carousel of different activities that involve um, reading. And that happens um, at different levels uh, across the school. And then our lessons start. But this, this term, we, we've always, um, our pupil voice has always been quite strong in our school with the, with the way that we um, plan uh, our lessons and our, our themes. Um, so th this term, however, we had a, a quite an in-depth discussion, and I think it was Holly who who spoke about uh, Maslow first, and then and then you, Randy, and and that's been quite a serious consideration for us. Um, 
and we've noticed the emotional needs of our, our pupils has increased quite considerably um, and, and and likely students as well you've got your cohort that you you expect to struggle with things but there are quite a few of the unexpected students struggling now as well so this this term um, the whole school have been working on um, developing a, a, an understanding of oneself and creating um, the class uh, community, if you like, before then uh, going uh, to look further afield with, with regards to the, the community of, of the school in, in Aberiron. Um, and we've been doing a, a, a lot of work around the trauma um, informed stuff, uh, as you uh, referred to, Randy. So there's definitely, um, we can identify with, with lots lots of uh, what you were saying there and the practical practical things um, with regards to our, our teachers our teachers have to be within um, with their classes they can't uh, be together um, in Kennedy Gion it, it's not advised for them to be together during lunch times which makes things quite difficult because we, we rely on each other quite a lot don't we as teachers and it's nice to have that uh, camaraderie um, so, so that's something that's missed at the moment, but we're really hoping that we can get that back uh, very soon. The other thing is uh, we have um, different classes using different toilets. So for example, because our building needs quite a bit of work, um, we, we've we had to have some mobile toilets uh, come in. We're waiting for them actually. Um, so, so that we, you know, our years five and six, for example, we've got 60 children. Uh, and they're sharing, uh, you know, a very small toilet block. So it's practical things like that that we've been having to deal with as well. And space is another issue. Uh, we're currently taking down two sheds so we can have a garden room um, put in. Um, so there's some kind of outside, outside posh shed basically where we can uh, have our interventions but we don't do interventions during lunch breaks um but we have we have as schools in wales and many of my colleagues from wales will uh, will 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 recognize this we've received lots of grant money to help us with um, the acceleration of learning post covid so there's lots of interventions going on that also has a knock on effect as you you mentioned as well randy with regards to recruitment Getting substitute teachers or supply teachers, we call them, is a nightmare for us uh, in, in Kennedy Gion. Um, there's been a surge in recruitment, A, and then B, there's hardly anybody left in, in, in the pool um, uh, for when people are ill or when people want to engage with, with professional learning. So um, that's kind of, in a nutshell, the things that we've been working on. Uh, our classes are, do are doing lots of work around empathy uh, and uh, emotional well-being. Uh, we work it into our day where we have little breaks for mindfulness um, just before going home and just before lunch. So, and just after lunch actually as well, those transition periods where children just have an opportunity to just quieten down and think. We also, Holly, use videos as well uh, in, our, in our reading time, just little um, news round clips, just uh, where we have an opportunity to look at what's going on in the world and that kind of thing. Um, but with regards to my other job with, with the authority, uh, I've had a great opportunity to travel to everywhere in Kennedy Gion. And for you to have an idea of where I live, um, it takes me 45 minutes to get to the nearest McDonald's. So sometimes I think that gives a little bit of context. Um, so I, I've done quite a bit of traveling uh, with, with my job. And basically what schools are doing at the moment is, is preparing for a new curriculum that has place-based learning um, at the heart of it really and uh, all the the principles that uh, Leslie referred to at, at the very beginning um, really um, struck a chord with this and really sort of reflect what's going on in Wales with regard to curriculum work. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Katrin. And thank you for making making the connections with so many of the other presenters and commonalities or, or unique um, unique differences for your, your experience too. Um, I think we have time for one, uh, I'll call it a speed round panelists. Uh, one, one final question to answer, um, answer briefly. Um, you've, you've spoken of, uh, to a bit of the obstacles and the opportunities of rural education. So I'm gonna um, bounce to our, our last question for, a, for a, um, a speed round of how, how does place shape your life as a teacher? So one, one way um, shared in brief of how, how place shapes your life as a teacher. 
Um, and let, let's start with, uh, with Lola for this round. Okay. Um, so there's definitely a big demographic challenge, especially because uh, our school is really small, as I said, from 20 to 25 students per year, um, especially because we know there isn't much we can do about it. Um, there are more children leaving the school than, than coming into kindergarten every year. So that's scary uh, for the town and, and for the school. Uh, they also have a short variety of role models. It's hard for them to look farther than the, than the town. Um, we don't want them to leave, but we want them to realize that, that there is more outside, outside the town and there are more things that they can do and, and they can explore and, and be different and really follow their passions. Um, so showing them that they have other opportunities outside what they see in the, in the town is hard. Um, but it's also good that the that the place where they live, the town is really small. It's 400 inhabitant town. So there is a really familiar setting between children, educators, parents, community members. Um, you're all part of a big family, and and that's helpful for the children because there is a closer relationship between families, um, and everything is smoother. Uh, some parents came to the same school and had the same teachers as their kids. So there's trust, love, and, and respect for each other. And also, I don't know if this applies to everyone, I don't think so, but in Spain, from my experience, there's a good amount of resources supplied by the region's government in comparison to urban schools. Every kid has a computer, um, and, and they, have, they have monetary resources and teacher resources. So this is really helpful. And regarding, it's always around the, the amount of students that they're in school. Um, so the students are mixed in, in, students from different grades are mixed in the same classroom. So it's really easy to learn from each other, um, to explore outside the school and learn from, from the environment. They know a lot about science, a lot about animals, a lot about um, plants. So the, surrounding, the surroundings of the school are really important and we know it's not, learning doesn't only happen in school, but also outside. So this bond is really strong and, and really important for us. So building this small community in this small town um, makes this, this school special and children grow up with admirable values and, and especially learning from each other and learning from the community is what makes it special and different from urban schools, in my opinion. And, and that's all, I don't want to take too long. Thank you, Lola. Um, Randy, next, um, just in brief, how, how does place shape your life as a teacher? Um, Lola, I absolutely love what you said about um, teaching students um, that our community is great, but also here's all these other opportunities around the world. Um, it is a difficult balance to, talk up your community, show them the benefit, just like Catherine was talking about, because you want them to give back to their community and become um, a valued citizen, just like they see all around them, but also to like give them the opportunity to learn about global culture as well. It's, it's a tough balance. Um, I would have to say that's uh, how place kind of inspires me the most as a teacher. Um, as an English teacher, I have more freedom of curriculum than science and math. I can apply those English standards to any text or with any writing topic, right? Um, so oftentimes I find place um, crossing my mind when I'm lesson planning. What mentor text, what book can I pick to teach students about our local community, but also about the world around them? Um, so, so just finding relevant texts that um, kind of teach our students about place too, whether it's locally or globally is, um, is how I'm inspired often. Thank you, Randy. Alan, next. Um, so when I think how uh, place shapes my life, um, I, I have to think that Whitland is uh, really quite a mellow place and nothing really happens. Uh, there's, there's not a lot here. There's a train station, so you can leave. Um, but uh, we, we haven't got all that much going on. And so when everyone comes to school, it, it, it's not just the place where the kids get their educational needs met they also get their social needs and there's a place for them to show their excellence and it just means that 
I just know them so well that I can get rid of all the, the most of the behavior management and, and we can really get down to right. What is the problem? What don't you understand and how can I help? And it really just, that, that relationship between teacher and student really sort of shapes uh, rural education for me because I just know most of the school that well to the point where I teach physics, but I have kids coming to me in the morning saying, sir, I don't know how to polish shoes. And so the other day I had, I had some kids in and I taught them to polish shoes. I think that just sums it up for me. Thank you, Alan. Catherine, next. I think the pupils in Whitland are very, very lucky to have Alan with them, who's obviously so enthusiastic. Um, I think I'd, I think I'd like to speak uh, with regards to perhaps the COVID um, situation, because I think one of the challenges from being a, a rural educator um, pre-COVID was the opportunities we had to collaborate um, because of geographical reasons and, and the, the budget sort of um, issues with that as well, with um, releasing people to, to meet, etc. But because of COVID, um, our world has opened up quite a bit where meeting and each other and discussing virtually has become far, far uh, easier. I mean, just what we're doing tonight is, is amazing, isn't it? And it, it's it's such an opportunity for us to really open up our eyes and, 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 and see the world and be able to collaborate and discuss different issues with, with educators from, from uh, across borders, to use the title. Um, but, but also, uh, as, as Radhandi referred to, with, with our pupils, it, it's something we can use there as well. Um, but I think sometimes when you have to explain your sense of place to somebody from somewhere else, it just reinforces that. And um, one of the beauties that we've got with uh, our new curriculum in Wales is that we're allowed to co-construct our curriculum um, design according to the needs of the pupils we have in our schools, in our localities. So we can, it's uh, the subsidiarity of it is a very, very important element and we have a fair bit of autonomy in that. So, so we, we find that um, it's, it's a real opportunity. Um, so the other side of COVID, of course, is although it's 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 opened things up for us, it, it has made the situation very difficult um, as well. Um, on the other side, with with regards to our rurality, with uh, an influx of, of pupils, especially um, people moving into um, what's considered to be a, perhaps a, a safer uh, environment, um, that's happened definitely in in Ceredigion, um, and and also. Um, just the, the general re recruitment uh, issues we have uh, makes it challenging as well. Um, but we can always overcome them and we, we find ways um, as educators. I think that's one thing we're all really good at. If, if somebody puts an obstacle in front of us, we will think of a million different ways to get over it using uh, creativity and, and innovation. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I, I covered what I wanted to say there. Thank you, Katrin. And Holly, to wrap us up. I think place shapes my teaching life um, way more than I thought it would getting into education. I think relationships for me are the biggest part of that. I, I didn't realize how big of a part of teaching it would be. So in our little community, um, I try to get the schedules of like their baseball games or horse shows or whatever my students are participating in so that I can go hang out with their families and cheer them on and, and support them that way. And that's actually helped me integrate into a community that isn't always, um, I mean, in small towns, at least in the US, if you aren't born there, you're not from there kind of a, a feel, but this particular community has kind of wrapped me in their arms and showed me that, you know, it's the relationships are the most important part. And in our community where it's low income and there's a lot of trauma that really um, helps get a lot of those basic needs met. And then we can move on to the education portion of it, but definitely the relationships. Thank you so much, Holly. 
Um, and I just want to take a moment and invite everyone in the session to share a big, um, a big thanks with the presenters. Um, you're welcome to unmute, give a little clap or, uh, or, um, or a, a, a quieter clap as well. But let's give some gratitude to our, our presenters. Thank you all so much, panelists, for sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> Awesome. Panelists, hopefully you can feel that um, that gratitude coming to you from around the world um, from from the folks that we have here. Um, and, and again, a heart a heartfelt thank you for your um, for your sharing and, and telling us a little bit about your lives and your stories and, and your connections and relationships with students. I'm grateful. We we still want to honor and, and hold some time for, for you all to get to connect in in some smaller groups as well. Um, and, and so what we're going to do shortly is transition into breakout groups. Um, in your breakout groups, um, you'll, you'll get to connect a little bit more with each other. Um, we've spread out some of the event organizers and the panelists between breakout rooms so, so that you'll get a chance to, um, to possibly connect with them. Um, and, and what we'd like to invite you to do in the breakout rooms is, is take a bit of time for introductions. And then I suspect you'll have time, likely for just, just maybe one or two of these questions. Um, so thinking about maybe what, what did you hear that surprised you? Uh, what similarities or differences did you notice um, in experiences? Um, and are there ideas or themes that you can implement in your own classroom or work? Um, so maybe be thinking about those, um, those questions, how you might introduce yourself. And we're gonna head into breakout rooms for about the next, um, next 12 minutes or so. When we come back together, um, we'll ask that there's one, one member of your group who shares, um, most likely in the chat, I think, and hope we'll be able to hear from one, one or two groups um, aloud as well, but just to hear a little snapshot of your conversation. Um, so I'll open the breakout rooms. If you're having any difficulty, there's an ask for help button that you can press in your breakout room to ask for some help. And um, I hope you enjoy getting a chance to talk with each other a bit more. We'll see you back in about 12 minutes. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, all right. And folks will be coming back shortly. All right, welcome back. Um, I hope you were having good conversations in your breakout groups. Um, I imagine we cut you off in the middle of a conversation, uh, most likely as so often happens in breakout rooms and just getting sucked back out through Zoom. Um, and, and I hope you were able still to get to connect with a few of each other and share, share some ideas and takeaways. Um, so I'd, I'd invite um, each group to add um, one of your takeaways or key ideas to the chat. And I think we have time to maybe hear from one or two groups aloud about what, um, what, a, what a takeaway or key learning um, was for, for your group. So um, I'll invite, um, invite maybe one or two group members to, um, to unmute and to share, um, share what you were thinking about. Well, I can, because it'll save me typing it in the chat. It's probably easier. Um, yeah, we, we spent about half the time just introducing ourselves and talking about what really resonated with us and what really stuck out was how much of everything that everybody said resonated with us. Um, and, and we thought about those sort of opportunities this group could present for building those links for our learners to, to link our rural areas to rural areas across the globe because they're, they're quite sheltered, uh, as Katie said, in many ways. They don't realise how sheltered they are. I think when I was a kid in a country school, I knew I was sheltered. I, I really did. But the, the, the internet has changed that and they feel quite worldly until you really drill down into it. Um, and, and Katie was absolutely right with that. And where we did that, I loved the, the idea of the day in the life video for teachers and learners that was mentioned in the comments. I think that could be really interesting. But also through, you know, we have the technology now, just like we're doing to virtual, you know, trips between schools and linking up is so much easier than it ever was. 
Um, and I personally also, I just this thought that there's a rural teacher corps and there's this bank of people who are committed to go into work and teach in rural areas as someone who knows firsthand the difficulty of recruitment in a rural area. Um, that really excited me. So I don't know if we could do something like we need to, we need to make one in Wales, Mark, don't we? But, uh, but yeah, that, that was what we talked about. Oh, it sounds like that was a, a fruitful conversation and a lot of, a lot of ideas shared. Thank you. Um, I see a couple ideas coming into the chat and, and I wonder if maybe one more person would, would share aloud with us. Yes, I'd be happy to share aloud. In our breakout group, one of the big things after our introduction, say about what we teach, one of the things we come across as very similar is actually budget. I know, I know in Britain, I know in Britain over the past look, many years, budgets have been cut and cut and cut so much. And one of them was actually saying that with science, couldn't have is getting to a point where the budget will be too small to buy any of the necessary stuff for practical lessons. And even in some schools to, I know one school, I know one of my breakout group partners was saying in Uganda, I think it's like $1 per child is paid for in education. Although like in Wales or like in the United Kingdom, education is supposed to be like free to the point of need. But then su surprising. And I think that's all I've got to really say about that. So thank you anyway. I'll shut up and I'll have others to. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thanks for sharing. And, and I think that that challenge of funding, um, the context and scale is different in each place. And, and I personally think education is the most important work in the world and, and funding for it should be a top priority um, for all countries to me. And I, I think that's reflected um, in the global goals as well, quality education and, and support and funding for education. Yeah, um, I know ideas are still coming in through the chat and I'd invite um, anyone whose group hasn't added yet to the chat to please do so. Um, and, and we're transitioning into the closing now. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, and Taylor, I'll, I'll hand it back to you to share a little bit about upcoming opportunities and, and next steps for folks as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here today. I know that as educators, there's a lot of demands for your time. And so we are so thankful that you spent some of your time today with us um, in this event. And thank you again to our panelists and facilitators for sharing. Uh, I did include a link in the chat for the Rural Schools Collaborative Team. Part of what we hope will be ongoing for rural educators across borders is that you will be sharing your story. Uh, and we have a link for folks to be able to submit their ideas about a day in the life, um, about your experiences as a rural teacher in your place. So uh, I would love to hear from you folks and we will send that out in a post event email um, for you to, to share your experiences. Um, we also have you folks now on our uh, emails, and so we will be sure to have you all as our newest members of the Rural Educators Across Borders um, in the loop as we continue to plan events like these, collaborations across teachers, um, and really take this program to the next step um, with your input. Uh, speaking of your input, we are going to send a post-event survey, and this is really important to us to hear your feedback because we want this program to be teacher-driven and we want the content to be relevant for teachers. And so if you're willing, we will post the event survey in the chat and we will also send it out via email to get your feedback. Um, finally, I want to say a special welcome to a lot of our rural teachers who joined from Uganda. We have an I Am a Rural Teacher podcast series and we have an interview coming out in the next couple of weeks with Frederick Mugalula. And so if you'd like to hear more about a day in the life of a teacher in Uganda, uh, please keep an eye out for that podcast and feel free to share your own stories. Mark or Leslie, any final comments for the group as we wrap up? And just obviously thanks everybody for coming along and uh, particular thanks also to Leslie for you know managing it all behind the scenes and not actually behind the scenes is actually sort of driving it in front of this on front of the stage as well so being great first event and you know I'm sure this is going to grow this is just a seed and we're going to sort of grow this and really look forward to sort of working with you all and hearing your ideas for in which way we should grow it. 
Thank you so much, Mark and Taylor, um, for inviting me to be part of this session. And um, I, I just want to say on behalf of all of your students, thank you to each of you educators for all that you're doing um, to connect with them as individuals, as unique humans, um, and, and to connect them with their places and communities. I, I feel grateful to get have gotten to hear a little bit of your stories and, and grateful on their behalf. Thank you. With that, I think we will go ahead and close out. Please keep an eye on your emails for that post event link with some resources and ways to continue connecting with each other. Have a wonderful day and thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.